Marion Davies was one of the brightest stars in Hollywood. Marion Davies was the first screwball comedian. She was arguably uh, the best female comedian on the screen. Yet today, Marion Davies is remembered for a lifelong love affair, while her professional reputation is based on a film in which she never appeared. What are you doing? Orson Welles' masterpiece, Citizen Kane, modeled on the life of William Randolph Hearst, painted a portrait of Marion Davies that the world believes true. Kane's mistress, Susan Alexander, is a gold digger and a drunk, a woman with no talent and no mind of her own. Citizen Kane contains an extraordinary performance, but it obscures the superb talent of the real person, has created a new myth, and justice must be done. Citizen Kane is maybe the greatest American film of all time. As far as Marion Davies is concerned, of course, identified with, with Hearst, as Hearst is thought to be identical with Kane. Marion Davies is not Susan Alexander. The difference was that Susan Alexander had no talent. Marion Davies had a lot of talent. She may have been hurt as much as she was helped by Hearst, which is the final irony of Marion Davies' life. It was a deep hurt for Marion, particularly. And um, I remember seeing the film and thinking it was casually done. Certainly a lot of people believed it as they do any film. It didn't have much to do with the truth. I'd rather you just talk. As far as Marion Davis is concerned, there are two big flaws in the picture. And the first one is that Marion Davis had no talent, which is preposterous. And the second is that the Susan Alexander character leaves Kane, who dies alone and unloved. But Marion Davis never left Hearst. Marion Davis wanders the halls through sleepless nights. Friends and family wait patiently as William Randolph Hearst fights his final battle. His sons are guests in the home where Hearst and Marion reside. Because of the long ordeal and too many cocktails, she is prescribed a sedative. As she sleeps, he passes away. When she awakens, every trace of William Randolph Hearst has vanished from her home. I didn't want to be with William Randolph Hearst. I wanted to be Marion Davies. The difference is to make it be broke up to the altar. And I say, you are now man and wife. Does that make love any more potent? Love comes from the heart. Marion Cecilia Doris was born in Brooklyn on January 3rd, 1897. The fifth and last child of Mama Rose and Ben Doris. Stern yet protective, Rose taught her girls to look for older, wealthy suitors to ensure their financial stability while avoiding the trap of romantic love, which she believed would inevitably fade. In Mama Rose's view, show business was the best way to find a rich man, so the Doris girls took to the stage early on. In the summer of 1914, at age 17, Marion made her debut on Broadway in the musical review, Chin Chin. Though her shy stammer made her an unlikely candidate for speaking parts, 
she quickly became a successful dancer in several featured roles. Marion's warmth and quick wit made her a favorite among her peers. One of the first pictures I found of her, she was probably about 16 years old, and I thought that we looked alike. So I sort of fiercely went on this quest um, to do my research, and in the end, I discovered this amazing woman, and I sort of fell in love with her in a way, and I thought, gosh, I wish I would have known her. Before long, Marion had a number of older admirers crowding her stage door. Standing in the back of this group, quiet but ever-present, was multi-millionaire publisher William Randolph Hearst. Hearst's character was a strange mixture of gentleness, generosity, and a need for power. He was a man of many parts and a complex man. I think he really wanted to be liked. He, he wanted to be loved, I suppose. Hearst met Marion at a time when he was searching for escape from the high society affairs that his wife, Millicent, enjoyed. He was often heard to say that the people in Millicent's circle were stuffed shirts and asses. Hearst found relief from her pretentious crowd with Marion. She called him W.R., and they were soon seen together at numerous after-theater affairs and parties, though she continued to play the field. Over time, Marion became Hearst's rebellious captive, and he would always remain her suitor. In a poem he sent to Marion in 1917, he wrote, I love a girl named Marion. She holds me in the thrall of her blue eyes and golden hair and figure, lithe and tall. She loves me too, she tells me so. Alas, that isn't all. She likewise loves Flo, Charlie, Henry, Neely, Joe, and Paul. She was also a rather free person, and she had affairs right under his nose all through their long career. He was 35 years older, and he's, he once told her that he knew the age span meant quite a bit, and he, he, he could overlook a lot. Hearst wrote to Marion when they were apart, I hate to leave you alone so long. I'm afraid you will wander along the primrose path. Be good, even if it is painful. I had great respect for him, and he had respect for me. Love, sympathy, and friendship, that's all. You're just as sweet as an angel I'm happy when you are near I couldn't do without you Really, dear I am sincere, angel child I'm just wild about you, angel child Say that you love me too In your arms forever I'll stay You drive away Shadows of gray when you smile. I'm in heaven. William Randolph Hearst was never a man to admit to limitations. Though his political views made him a favorite whipping boy of the liberal press, he successfully built the most powerful media empire of the day. Besides having the largest newspaper and magazine publishing chain in the nation, Hearst had been producing films since 1913. Marion had also begun working in film, providing the story and starring in the 1917 production, Runaway Romany. She thought the results embarrassing, but Hearst demanded a screening. Impressed with the potential he saw, he told Marion that he would make her a star. I think she has been wrongfully depicted as a kind of whore because she did accept his money. But I think uh, if there's love involved in such a relationship, that takes away that stigma. Hearst found a way to spend time close to Marion's side by making her head of production of his company in New York, Cosmopolitan Pictures. 
In addition to the movies in which she starred, Marion, along with W.R., oversaw the filming of dozens of other features. He made it understood that his friend was no glorified chorus girl. She was a gifted actress and a savvy businesswoman. I think that one of the wonderful things that Hearst brought to Marion's career was this enormous sense of theatricality, and you see that right from the beginning in the magnificent premiere he gave to Cecilia of the Pink Roses. He had thousands and thousands of pink roses put around the movie screen as a bower in a kind of setting, and then the odor from those roses wafted out into the audience during the screening. I mean, imagine the glamour of that and the sense that the audience would have of, this is a special movie, this is a special woman. With his attention to detail, Hearst's 1922 production of When Knighthood Was in Flower was the first million dollar picture to make a profit. This was at a time when most features cost less than one-tenth of that to produce. The New York Review reported, it looks as if Miss Davies will have to be reckoned with for herself alone hereafter. But one reviewer thought that the production overshadowed the star. Why talk about how much was spent on the lovely costumes? Why don't you give Marion Davies a chance? She is a good actress, a beauty, and a comedy starring bet. Hearst hired the reviewer for his own paper, and she began a lifetime career as one of Hollywood's most renowned gossip columnists. Her name, Luella Parsons. W.R. had found a way to control Marion's life by taking control of her career. In 1924, Hearst outdid himself with another big budget costume spectacle. Though it met with some critical praise, the public did not respond. Janice Meredith became a notorious flop. She knew who she was, I think, as an actress, but yet she always let him take the upper hand. And that's the side of Marion that always falters. You know, here's this dichotomy. She's this very, very strong, funny, ballsy broad. She was a broad, she was a dame, and no one was gonna tie her down and tell her how to run her life. But then there's this other side, which is more childlike, and allows him to take care of her and tell her what to do. Screenwriter Francis Marion had been a former Hearst reporter. After the failure of Janice Meredith, W.R. asked Francis to create star vehicles for Marion Davies. Francis Marion would actually look him in the eye and say, Chief, I don't think this is working, and this is why. And Francis would think she'd gotten through. And then all of a sudden, he would sort of look away and say, oh, wouldn't it be nice if Marion was out in a wheat field and with a beautiful bonnet on? And sometimes she would say, Mr. Hurst, we already have her with three dogs, two cats. We don't need any more cute animals. W.R. insisted on authenticity for the elaborate sets which surrounded Marion, using statuary and tapestries that he had purchased through the years. His own masterpiece was his astonishing collection of art and antiquities housed in three palatial homes. Wintoon in Northern California, St. Donat's in Wales, and his beloved estate at San Simeon, California. Marion lived with W.R. in these palaces, while Millicent, still legally Hearst's wife, remained in New York. 250 miles north of Los Angeles, the ranch at San Simeon became one of the most famous homes in America, known as Hearst Castle. The leading lights of journalism, literature, politics, and the movies all came to the castle where W.R. held court. Marion's friends joined in costume parties and other wild shenanigans at their home. These private home movies feature a fascinating cast who clown it up for the camera. Hearst could always count on Marion to bring fun and merriment to the castle.
Back on the East Coast, screenwriter Frances Marion found the perfect role for Marion to integrate her comedic talent with the high drama that Hearst preferred for her. The story of little old New York follows an Irish girl, Pat O'Day, who travels to America. I think that ultimately what happened for Marion Davies is she evolves a person for her career that has a duality, that she has dual roles. Little Old New York is a really good example of this duality because she plays a young woman who's called on to impersonate her own brother in order to get her inheritance. Her androgyny is a kind of comic and comfortable one. She doesn't seem to feel she needs to apologize or to even take the attitude that anybody believes that she's a boy. She just does it with a very modern sense. Little Old New York became one of the biggest hits of Marion's career. The New York Times, no fan of Mr. Hearst, nevertheless called it one of the most exquisite productions ever thrown upon the screen. 1924 was the year that Hearst formed an alliance with Louis B. Mayer of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. Marion and W.R. moved their production company from New York to Los Angeles and joined forces with the most powerful studio in the world. What that really meant to Mayer and to Thalberg was guaranteed press for MGM Films. The Davies and Hearst affair had gone on for nine years and for much of that time, they had made their home together. While even non-Hearst papers maintain a virtual blackout regarding Marion and W.R.'s personal relationship, this most public of unmarried couples was not immune to private rumor. She told all of her close friends that she really loved Hearst and would do nothing to ever hurt him. But she came very close with Charlie Chaplin. In fact, Hearst found that her relationship sometimes were dangerous. I mean, the situation could easily get out of hand. Charlie Chaplin figured in the most spectacular rumors surrounding Marion and W.R. In 1924, Thomas Ince, one of Hollywood's top producers, was taken ill while a guest on Hearst's yacht. Within a few days, Ince died. Immediately, rumors flew that he'd been shot by Hearst. Many versions of the story circulated, the most common being that Hearst, in a jealous rage, had mistaken ends for Chaplin. Who would shoot him? If anything of the sort had happened, well, everybody would have been in jail, wouldn't they? Contrary to the charge that the story was buried by Hearst, the incident made front page news. Though evidence to support the allegation was virtually non-existent, the charge that Hearst had gotten away with murder was repeated both in rumor and in print for years to come. Such scandal was curiously out of sync with the kindness and generosity for which Marion was known by her friends. It was yet another myth that would color her reputation. One little boy, Carl Roop, who was selling newspapers at the studio, was whisked into Marion's car and made into an extra for the day on the set of The Red Mill. I got to meet a lot of people, a lot of nice people. It's Marion Davies uh, paid for my school. She was a... Uh, very great great person, generous person. She helped a lot of people, even some of the, the people that had never been in a studio, and she found out about it and we saw that somebody took care of them. It was on the 1927 production of The Red Mill that the comedian and Marion Davies began to shine. The same year, in Quality Street, Marion triumphed in the sort of period drama that was so close to W.R.'s heart. As Phoebe Thrussell, Marion played a beautiful girl whose lover leaves her to fight in the Napoleonic Wars. Street, she takes on a dual role that really gives her more acting range than she had primarily had before. She plays a young woman who's 
sweetheart fails to propose to her before he goes away to war. And by the time he comes back, she's aged and become somewhat drab and lifeless. So he then rejects her. And she's offended and takes on then the role of impersonating her former self as a younger, even livelier presence. Finally, a year later, Marion broke the mold of the costume dramas in which W.R. had confined her. She was teamed up with top director of the day, King Vidor. Sought by Hearst because of his reputation with drama, Vidor told him he wanted to make a comedy with Marion. Hearst relented, and the result was a fresh kind of character never before seen on the screen, the screwball heroine. I remember that other thing Colbert thought she had talent as a comedian. I thought the brightness that she had was of a comedic nature. Marion had a wicked sense of humor. She is scintillating on the screen. She could be regarded as the first screwball comedian. And she certainly long before Carol Lombard created that role in the talkies. The screwball comedian in film is relentless in the pursuit of her man, but as dizzy as she appears, she turns out to be a lot wiser than she lets on. Oh, I know my baby loves me. I can tell my baby loves me. But there ain't no maybe in my baby's eyes. Even though she don't express it, she might just as well confess it. For there ain't no maybe in my baby's eyes. At the end of the day, she always gets her guy. I wish each evening could last a week. Cause I know my baby loves me. I can tell my baby loves me. Cause there ain't no maybe in my baby's eye. The Patsy became the ideal vehicle for one of Marion's favorite jokes. Her comic impressions of other leading actors, actresses, and public figures of the day something W.R. would always ask her to do to entertain the guests at the castle. My father and Marion had been very good friends, and he admired her vivacity, her expressions, her energy. And that's what often a director is looking for, is someone with a lot to give. Marion's second film of 1928 was The Cardboard Lover where she plays a dizzy American autograph hound in Europe who falls for a French tennis champion. She disguises herself to coax him away from his lover's embrace. As in earlier films, Marion took every opportunity for comic imitation, this time of her exotic co-star, Jetta Goodall.
The Cardboard Lover was a small-scale production, but the reviewers fell over themselves with delight because it was a totally fresh comedy performance coming from somebody who had already created remarkable films. They couldn't quite put their fingers on it, but if they'd had the term, they would have used screwball comedienne. When you have a remarkably beautiful woman who is very funny, that is so rare as to be um, irresistible. Marion Davies could pull off things that nobody else could have pulled off. And one of the examples was that when George Bernard Shaw came to this country, saying, no interviews, no interviews, no interviews. Now, of course, Marion Davies was the one person who could saddle up to him and sweet talk him in a way to give an interview to, of all people, Luella Parsons. He didn't know how to say no to this woman who's with this very sweet stutter. And there goes George Bernard Shaw. Through the fun and games and endless parties, one ache remained for Marion. W.R.'s wife, Millicent, refused to grant him a divorce. And while Marion loved him and for the most part played by his rules, she felt abandoned when family and business demanded his return to the East Coast and Millicent sighed. Whenever Marion felt terribly trapped, she drank, carefully hiding it from W.R. She was painfully aware that there were those who would never forgive her for the choice she had made. I was just 13. Marion had invited me to go to a big costume party, a New Year's Eve party at the beach house. And there was great hue and cry. They telegraphed Mother to stop me from going to that house. That was quite a, a no-no, or uh, you don't do that. They were living together in sin. I mean, the, the, the point of view was pretty encompassing. to say, I want to protect you. I keep saying, forget it. I don't want it that way. In other words, let's say you don't want to make me an honest woman, which is rather ridiculous because <laughs> he was as honest as I was, or we both honest. There was no reason for making anybody honest. Riding a wave of professional success, Marion was teamed for a second time with King Vidor. Show people became Vidor and Marion's personal raspberry to their own publicity, and one of Hollywood's comic masterpieces. Vidor saw that she had a kind of wonderful, perky, independent spirit that was just made for comedy. He talked a lot about show people. I mean, he really thought that that was a, a, a superior film. And Hollywood has never been really that good about making films about itself. But that's a wonderful Hollywood film. It, it caught all that aspiration that so many young women in every boom town dreamed of coming to Hollywood and making it great and famous on the screen. We originally had Marion and Gloria Swanson had hit in the face with a pie. And this was a big stumbling block. Uh, Mr. Hurst would not go for this with mine. Hurst said quite defiantly, it doesn't take any beauty to get a pie in the face. Hurst didn't want people laughing at her. And they had to uh, get the, somebody from the examiner to uh, make an urgent phone call that he had to leave. And, and take it in an office. And while he was gone, they did the, the seltzer business. Show people was my favorite of all of the pictures my father's ever made. When I was doing interviews over here, I kept hearing about this extraordinary work of Marion Davis. As technicians fell ill. She anonymously paid for their operations. She was a very generous and kind-hearted person. Frances Marion would start to resent some of the other young friends of Marion Davies because she saw that Marion and Mr. Hurst were being used. People could go to her with any problem, no matter or anything they might have done that was wrong or something. She was always tolerant and understanding and ready to help that person. Tennessee Williams said, 
Marion Davies makes up for the rest of Hollywood. And that says it all. Please. I don't know when the talking started, yet, but they weren't very good. And uh, I was not only appalled at the idea, but I thought I didn't want to go back. I thought I'd like to jump off the boat or any place which the earth would open up because I, I thought I cannot do something. I stalled before I finally ride home. After 12 months' delay, Marion took on the sound cameras in 1929. In her first talkie, Marianne, she plays a French girl who must impersonate a military officer. To get back to that story, you know? <clears throat> Gee, you young officers are soft. Don't you take no exercise? Sure. Ah, but you don't take enough. Look at me. Look at that bunch of fives. Get a load Look at of this. Yeah, get a load of this. Get a load of this. Get a load of this. Get a load of... One of the things that you note about Marion Davies in her sound work is how good she is at doing accents. So her ability to mimic was total. It was physical head to toe, it was facial gestures, but it was also voice. She clearly had an excellent ear. They tried to do that a lot in the early sound era, and she was one of the few that could really master it effectively, and that's something she has not been given credit for. Do I love mon baby? Does he love his chérie? What can the answer be? Oh, la, 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 la. On screen, in talkies, she has a lovely speaking voice. Absolutely. It's one of the things that endeared many of her fans. The very thing she feared most was one of her greatest assets. And when Hearst renegotiated his deal with Mayer, it was on the strength of the Marion Davies film. Oh, la, 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 la. Her second talking feature gave her the opportunity to work a third and final time with director King Vidor. Marion had an enormous talent, but when she was off camera, you know, she was enormously funny, very, very witty. But she stuttered. And once Marion got before the camera, a funny thing happened to us. She lost her stuttering. It made me think of Araby and the moon salt desert. I always say that too. <laughs> Mr. Bob, we're going to beat them. When I was a little boy, well, I loved the movies. Happy? At the time, I had a very bad stutter. And I heard that this beautiful woman on the screen had a stutter. And to me, that was like a light in the dark, that she could overcome that handicap. She was my heroine. Now, somebody tell me, which is higher, a heart or a spade? Or, or do you discard from strength to weakness, Mr. Forbes? Of course, it really doesn't matter unless we're playing for money. Are we playing for money? Well, we can decide that after the game. But I always like to know what my partner's rules are. So many people have different ideas of playing bridge. For instance, some people want you to give them a bid on a week no trump. Of course, it's customary to give your partner your long suit on a week no trump. But it's very difficult to know anything unless you have a very good hand. And of course, if you haven't a good hand, in that case, why, you just say nothing. But of course, your partner does expect a bid from you. I realize that. But after all, if you haven't a good hand, what can you do? Oh dear, here we are. The Floridora Girl, set in the gay 90s, is a story built on Marion Davies' early years in the theater when she first met W.R. All I've got is Georgie Smith, and he works in a cigar store. Say, who is Jack Barber? He's a bad boy. He eats little girls like you. Listen, you gotta work hard to get a rich man. You gotta work a darn sight harder if you don't get one. For its climax, the Floridora Girl switched from black and white to two-strip Technicolor. As always, Hearst made certain that Cosmopolitan pictures were among the most elaborate of MGM's releases. Marion was accustomed to entertaining top dignitaries and celebrities on her sets.
Marion worked long hours, completing two productions every year, and she shines in these pre-code comedies. Say, what do you mean, Mountain Bank? Now, Tony, Mrs. Webb was just asking if your mother was on the stage. Yeah? Well, you can tell Mrs. Webb that my mother was on the stage and that she was a headliner. And you can also tell Mrs. Webb that if she makes any more cracks about my mother, I'll start something that'll take the snap out of her garters. Oh, Marion's geez. impersonations only benefited Why from the new dimension of sound. Like she deftly parodies Garbo. Because I'm a cad. How tired you are. Yes. <laughs> I am tired. So tired. Marion's film career began to keep her from W.R., as he spent more time working alone at San Simeon. She had affairs with her leading men, falling in and out of love as quickly as she fell in and out of character. Want me to go now? W.R. wrote to her from a business trip. Yes. I wish I knew what you were doing in Los Angeles, Hello? but I guess it's just as well I don't. Sure. The temptations, I suppose, the are very great. Ultimately, her loyalty would always remain with W.R. Hearst may have relented for the comedies, but he had not forgotten his desire to find a truly noble role for Marion. He was certain he had it in the first sound production of Peg on My Heart, a classic from the stage. The role of Peg called for a much younger actress, but Marion took command of the part with her elfish charm and her talent for mastering dialects. In this case, I beg your an pardon. Irish brogue. Are you Mr. Chichester? I am not. Mr. Chichester is dead. Oh, I'm not sorry now. And what did he die of? Pneumonia. It became Hearst's favorite of all her features. Oh, that's terrible. Oh, pneumonia. I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Jarvis. He believed it deserved the highest recognition. Me own name now is Peg. Now As a result, he campaigned forcefully, though unsuccessfully, to win her an What's Academy that? Award. What's that you're saying? That mother gets 5,000 pounds a year for your education. Oh, so you got paid for abusing me. In spite of his power and influence, Hearst was powerless to help Marion gain the recognition oh, that she deserved. Do you think you'll be happy in Ireland? Sure, I'll be happy. I'll be doing a little fishing be like. I'll be planting potatoes in the garden. But there's all sorts of work to be done that I'm known how to do. And there's people that I'm liking. Michael will be with me. Only one thing will be missing. In the press, Hearst's enemies attacked him as an all-controlling media baron and assailed the powerful columnist who had become his eyes and ears in Hollywood. Luella Parsons is Hearst's Hollywood stooge, said the journal New Theater. Luella's chief function is to bellyhoo Marion Davies, the blonde girlfriend of her boss. Winsome Marion Davies, who knows how to bring out the best in her co-stars without losing any of her own appeal, is my idea of an unselfish actress. She lives and lets live. I truly look forward to seeing her in Page Miss Glory. Signed, Harold Riddle, 808 Walnut Street, Fulton, Kentucky. I got a card in the mail and it said something like this, you may think that Marion Davies is the greatest star in the world or you may admire her very much, but did you know she's the common law wife of William Randolph Hearst? Good evening, Lady Bear. In 1933, Marion starred in the musical Going Hollywood with Bing Crosby. The two of them clowned incessantly and drank heavily on and off the set. I discovered that there was a real sadness in Marion. Maybe, maybe not sadness, but maybe more melancholy, just a tinge. She was known to drink too much, and sometimes I think she liked it because it bothered her so much. The next year, Marion starred with Gary Cooper in Operator 13, a story about spies in the Civil War. I was the boom boy, the sound boom boy. And Miss Davies came in. She was a professional, you know. She didn't come in, she didn't yell, she didn't have problems with the director. Get up, Yankee. There was nothing in the whole spectrum of giving a performance that she didn't excel in. 
She had wonderful what we call body language. She had great control. And I don't think she ever quite got the credit. I couldn't help you. I knew what would happen if I were caught. And I'm caught now. That pays for everything, doesn't it? In 1934, Hearst's relations with Louis B. Mayer became strained. W.R. had sought to have Marion cast in two MGM productions, Marie Antoinette and The Barretts of Wimpole Street. He was convinced that these films would be successful, and they were, starring studio chief Irving Thalberg's wife. Incensed, Hearst moved Marion, complete with her elaborate Spanish bungalow, from MGM over to the Warner Brothers lot. But the new partnership would not last long. In the comedy, Ever Since Eve, she plays a hard-working secretary who is fed up with her boss's expectations. And if you make another move, I'll let you have the third volume. Miss Wynn, stop. This is outrageous. Yes, he is. When a girl can't make an honest living just because a nasty please, old man like you. please me. In fact, you couldn't. So she disguises herself and dresses her? down for the job of a writer's what do you assistant. Think? I wouldn't want to tell you the first thing that comes into my head. Miss Belden tells me that you're very eager to get started on your new book. Yes. Frantic, I believe, is the word. Uh, have you got a title here? I'm thinking of calling it David Copperfield. Oh, that ought to make a good movie. Yes, I... What are you doing to your face? Why, nothing. What do you want me to do with it? William Randolph Hearst was now 71 years old, and Marion was approaching 40. She was faced with the fact that the indomitable Hearst was aging and that he needed her now more than ever before. Marion decided it was time to quit the movies. Had she wanted, she could have quit WR as well. She said later, I thought the least I could do for a man who had been so wonderful and great, one of the greatest men ever, was to be a companion to him. When they weren't entertaining at Hearst Castle or Marion's beach house, W.R. and Marion traveled around Europe, always bringing along an entourage of friends and family. Hearst's rich lifestyle seemed limitless, but his spending was out of control. By the late 30s, Marion discovered that W.R.'s fortune had been seriously damaged, even as hers had prospered. So she sat down and wrote out a check to William Randolph Hearst for one million dollars. Marion Davies saved the Hearst Empire at one critical point when his notes had been called in by the banks. I think it was a conspiracy. They all got together and said, let's give, him, give it to him. She sold her real estate property and pulled a million dollars together in almost a day. Then suddenly it turned out that that wasn't going to do it. She never ostentatiously uh, wore jewelry, so she picked up all the gold and diamonds and carried them into his room. And uh, she dumped it under his nose and said, what will this bring? What do you think this will bring? A friend later heard her say, they weren't smart. They didn't figure on me at all. They thought I was a non-entity, a dullard, a stupid who sits in the corner with a dunce cap. Hearst realized that Marion Davies was the only person who was there to help him. He was so moved that he planned to fight for his divorce so that after 22 years, he could finally marry her. Hearst was so grateful to Marion for what she did. He never forgot that. Harry Ruby, who was married to one of Marion's best friends, told me about the 40 some odd people were flown down to the Hearst Ranch in Mexico and they had a priest who had agreed to marry them and Hearst had negotiated for months with his wife's lawyers and they were able to uh, work out a deal, it seemed. The priest was standing there and when the, this call came through and it was an insistence that Cosmopolitan be thrown into the hopper and that was too much for Hearst. It was his favorite magazine, he would not give that up. So he packed everybody on the airplanes, he flew them back to Wintoon in Northern California, and at that point, Marion disappeared for a couple of days, and it was on a binge that really 
never totally ceased. You're rough for funny, aren't you? Well, I can tell you one thing you're not going to keep on being funny about, and that's my well, sin. said I'm that Citizen Kane is a great allegory, but it's not necessarily accurate history. Well, that's true. You will continue with your singing, Susan. A mentor is, is trying to create a career for Susan Alexander as Hearst tried to shape a career for Marion Davies. <laughs> By the time Kane was released, it had been four years since Marion's last film, and so she was easily confused with Susan Alexander. Hearst had taken his lumps in the public arena before, but when he saw Marion attacked in Orson Welles' film, it was more than he could stand. I'd rather you just talk. The drinking made Hearst comment on the film. About yourself and Mr. Kane. It would money a lot of what comes into my mind about myself and Mr. Charlie Kane. He said they should never have brought in the drinking. I couldn't stand that on the screen. It was Marion he was worried about, not himself. He never gave a damn about what anybody said about him. He didn't have to ask. Everyone around him sprang into action to defend their chief. Listen, the voters of this state and Mrs. Kane Gossip columnists Hedda Hopper and Luella Parsons were vicious in their denunciations. Louis B. Mayer, still an ally, offered to buy the negative from RKO for $800,000 and burn it. The Hearst Press didn't mention the film by name and pulled publicity for other RKO releases as well. He's the richest man in America. Oh, the things he said to me, he threatened Get his. And Orson always said you. And I certainly didn't intend to portray her. That was not meant to be Marion Davies. You can't, Mr. Kane. Charles. He's always said, I, the only thing I regret about Citizen Kane is that Marion got the, the wrong end of the, the bill. She didn't deserve what the public felt about her. Rather than hide from the public, Marion decided to speak out in defense of a friend. Ingrid Bergman uh, became pregnant in Europe with Rossellini's child. She was married at the time. Marion had an article printed in the Hearst Papers in defense of Bergman, who the whole world had turned against. He was nailed to the cross. Now, I have to stand up for a principle. Angel Bremen is a great woman, and she's in love. If a woman of her great character has character enough to really go ahead with her love, why should she be criticized? This was typical of Marion Davies' eagerness to support and to help. Marion became her champion, really, and made it quite public that she felt that Ingrid should be judged on her goodness and not on an affair. By 1942, when Hearst turned 79, his love affair with Marion had lasted for 27 years. In private, the most famous unmarried couple in America lived happily, entertaining close friends and relatives at the castle. One member of the family who made the castle her home was Marion's niece, Pat Lake. Marion and Pat were very, very close. Pat told me that on her wedding day that Mr. Hurst told her that he was, in fact, her father. It was pretty, pretty common knowledge around town. They hoped it was true because she was Mrs. Hurst in every other way. I hope she had that to remember. WR by. After the Second World War, it became clear that WR's health was poor, and a permanent move closer to advanced medical facilities might be required. For his very last birthday, he was bedridden in the house in, in Beverly Hills, and Marion's gift to him was a painting that she had commissioned of her mother holding him as a little baby. And he started to burst into tears. And she was seated on the floor. He's seated in his wheelchair, and she just grabbed him by the knees. It was a most touching scene. Recalling those last few days with Hearst, 
She said later, I told him nobody dies nowadays, not with science. Let's do the Charleston. And so we danced down the hall. He used to laugh and he used to think I was crazy, but it did pep him up. On August 13, 1951, Marion Davies awoke to an empty house. There was no trace of William Randolph Hearst left in her home. I was driving to Paramount Studios, heard it on the radio, and went through every red light. I got there quickly enough to watch Hearst's body being removed and taken down to a small kind of laundry delivery truck. They attempted to make it appear that he had never really been with Marion in Beverly Hills. And Marion had been sedated. She was awakened late in the afternoon and rushed into his room and discovered that the place had been totally stripped of everything except one photograph of Marion Davies. She said to me, I had him for 32 years, and whoosh, he's gone. The family flew the body to San Francisco for a grand funeral. Marion had been abandoned. I loved that she called Hearst Pops, because it just fit. I had this, like, I had this overwhelming sense that she, that she probably had that, just the grief that she must have gone through when he died and they tricked her out of his body and she never got to say goodbye, Pops. She changed entirely. She was obviously drinking and it was kind of a devil may care kind of attitude and so to heck with it. 10 weeks later, Marion Davies became Mrs. Horace Brown. I think it's ironic that Marion's legitimate relationship with Horace Brown, which was an unhappy relationship, was considered the right thing to do, whereas for 35 years she'd had such a marvelous love affair with W.R. Although Brown, a longtime acquaintance, bore an uncanny resemblance to Hearst, they had nothing else in common. W.R. had hated Marion's problem with alcohol, and he had done everything he could to try to protect her. Horace Brown, on the other hand, encouraged Marion's drinking. She no longer had to hide her affliction. Marion's beloved ocean house was sold in May 1957 and was torn down to make way for a parking lot. Over the next decade, the genuine successes of her movie career were forgotten. Critics who had grown up without Marion Davies' films, but with the shadow of Citizen Kane's Susan Alexander, claimed that Marion was a weak actress, that her sound career had been destroyed by her stuttering, and that she had been Hearst's puppet all along. The Marion Davies that millions had known from the screen was slowly being erased from public memory. Who used to come to San Simeon in those old days? Well, Pop used to conduct his business up there, so there'd be a lot of executives. But along with them, there'd be people like, oh, Winston Churchill and George Bernard Shaw, presidents like Coolidge and Hoover, and other friends like Mary Pickford, Harold Lloyd, Louis B. Mayer, Luella Parsons. There might be as many as 40 guests at once. One important name is never mentioned. I met Marion Davies in 1951. She was having a party for orphan children at the Macombo nightclub. She was exactly what I had hoped she would be. She was warm, she was funny. She, she had a way of, when you're talking to her, you could tell she was listening to you. And after about 20, 25 minutes, she said, I gotta go pee. And that was Marion. In these later years, Marion focused her attention on two passions, charity and real estate. In the middle 50s, I met Miss Davies in the law office where I worked. She was magic, she was fun, she was, she was smart, really smart, good businesswoman. She had started the Marion Davies Children's Clinic in 1928, and when the University of California Medical Center in Los Angeles saw to add a wing, 
Marion wrote out a check for nearly two million dollars. All the time that Marion Davies is ever portrayed on film, uh, it's always wrong. And I did it too. She was fun loving and they sort of have her being this brainless bimbo. I mean, they nailed us, didn't they? <laughs> the crazy old man and his whore. The reality of Marion is so much more interesting and cinematic. I think the last word is that Orson would be thrilled that these myths are being dispelled. My office was not the same without Miss Davies calling up and telling me a really good joke. <laughs> Just being her really fun self. I think I've seen most of Davies' films, I would say, all of them. I've never seen a moment that she wasn't in control or in character. God knows we all miss her. We, we all we miss her. We won't be crying either, will we, no. big girl? We'll be laughing. <laughs> Already, Mr. O'Connell. I'm coming. Call me that name again. So I'll feel warm till you come after me. Call me your name for me. Peg me heart. <laughs> Marion Davy succumbed to cancer in 1961 at the age of 64. After many years and after much work by preservationists, Marion's films can finally begin to speak for themselves. I remember when we were talking about show people after we'd seen it, Vidor turned to me and said, she was really good, wasn't she? And I think that, that summed it all up. I mean, she really was good. Thank <laughs> you. 